Hello everyone, welcome to the second Sabbath school of the two of the year 2021. Before we start, let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we ask that you forgive us from our sins. Be merciful to us, Lord. Please pour your Holy Spirit upon us, Lord. Possess us as we study your word that it may change our lives, Lord. Please bless the listeners and the viewers as they also study the lesson in us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, this morning we are we have Sir Hilario Relis. Thank you, Sir, and Sir uh, Ian Ner Cervantes for helping us in teaching the Sabbath School lesson. The title of our lesson for January 2 to January 8 is the Crisis of Leadership. Our memory text is in Isaiah 6 1. Sir Hill, do you want to read that? Uh, to the memory verse, thank you. Isaiah 6 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Thank you so much, sir. So, for this week, we are going to study roughly Isaiah uh, chapter 6. And, uh, Sir Ian, please give us an overview of the whole week's lesson for the Sunday. What does it mean that? The title, The King is Dead, Long Live the King. Well, thank you very much, Sir Win, and happy Sabbath to everyone. We have a very interesting lesson this week about Isaiah. Actually, this is uh, very deep, but I think and I believe that with the help of the Holy Spirit, we will be able to understand what this lesson is trying to say to us. If we will look at this and this lesson, and... It says here that uh, the story of King Uzziah, if we will try to read it in Second Chronicles verse 26, it has a very good uh, highlights, no? Highlights in his reign as king. Imagine he was 16 years old when he was installed as a king. And then according to the text, if you will read the whole chapter, he reigned for 52 years. That was a very long time, you know, 52 years. And then the very good point here, I noted that uh, it says that he did was what was right in the sight of the Lord. I tried reading the full, uh, the Old Testament actually. We will see there the story of different kings that when these kings are doing what was right in the Lord's sight, they are really blessed by God. And God really prospered his reign as the king. And because of that, God fortified the city through him. Uh, he was granted with many uh, warriors, armies that can fight, you know. And his fame is spread out to neighboring countries. If we will look at the verse, if we will try to read it. And one thing more, he also loves farming. <laughs> you see, he loves farming. It was stated somewhere in those verses, if you will read it. And he has, like I've said, he has an army of men who went to war by companies. So they are really organized. We can see here how King Uzziah organized his, his, uh, his kingdom. Okay, But this is the very uh, sad part of the story because it says that but when his heart became proud, it leads to his destruction. And what happened was, um, he tried to enter God's temple by himself and he tried to burn an incense, which actually he was not allowed to do that because he was not from the line of Aaron, the Levites, because it's only the Levites that are allowed to do that, um, that part in the temple. So what happened was, he was reprimanded actually and the uh, priest tried to stop him but right at that moment god i think god struck him with with leprosy so as a result king hosea was isolated he lived outside you know he was cut off from the lord from the house lord from from the from the city itself from the kingdom and he lived with a leprosy until the time of his death. So, it is really wonderful at first, but it the story has a sad ending, and that's really what happens if uh, we will divert, you know, 
we will divert from the path that God wants us to take. Okay, sir, it is a lesson for us not to be proud even if we are successful, yes, right? Yes. So all of these things, uh, the Bible says that this uh, history are for our own benefit so that we will not fall into the same mistakes. So this is the background of the book of Isaiah, the setting. Uh, one of the things that happened in that history and then so when the usually the nation of israel has a problem the lord calls prophets and we are going now to the monday lesson holy 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 this is uh, isaiah 6 1 to 4. in isaiah 6 1 to 4 it is the story about isaiah being called a prophet and i want to read this in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on, the th on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train on, on his robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one cried to another, saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. Oh, so Isaiah. So, you know, uh, God said in Exodus that He will live in the temple, but only the holy, the high priest can go there inside, and only once a year. And even Moses wanted to see God, but he only saw the back of God. There are other prophets who who had encounter with God, but Isaiah saw uh, God in the temple, so he was very afraid. It says here, Daniel also saw, I watched till thrones were put in place in Daniel 7, 9, and 10. His garment was white as snow. So, you know what? Oh, oh, so many things that you can see, Sir Hill and Sir Ian. God, you know, everybody in the Bible wants to see God. Moses, you know, this is a very good prophet and a leader, but his whole life, he just wanted to see God, even David. So this is very comforting. I think it seems in the pattern in the Bible, when you have a very difficult job to rebuke and reprove God's people and they do reformation, God, it's very heavy burden and God comforts you with uh, these uh, miraculous things. Let's see what happened to Daniel in Daniel 7, 9, and 10. I watched till thrones were put in place, and the Ancient of Days was seated. His garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame, its wheels burning with fire. Even Sister Ellen G. White, Sir Hill, when she had a vision of heaven, she doesn't want to get out of the vision, but she has a mission. The, his, her companion said, you, you, you have to go back to earth and warn them. If you are faithful, you will take the grapes and the fruits there in heaven. So, you know, you, you can forget everything in this life, all our problems, all our money, our equipment, and God is the most uh, important thing to see in this life. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him a thousand, thousand ministered to him 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him the court was seated and the books were opened okay also you will see those things in revelation 4 and 5 now uh, sir i want to read the uh, ellen g white uh, paragraph in prophets and kings page 303 to 309 that is the call of isaiah the long reign is of Isaiah is in the land of Judah and Benjamin was characterized by a prosperity greater than of any other rulers since the death of Solomon nearly two centuries before for many years the king ruled with discretion under the blessing of heaven his armies regained some of their territory that had been lost in former years cities were rebuilt and fortified and the position of the nation among the surrounding peoples was greatly strengthened commerce Revived and the riches of the nations flowed into Jerusalem. Uzziah's name spread abroad, for he was marvelously helped till he was strong. Second Chronicles 
26. This outward prosperity, however, was not accompanied by a corresponding revival of spiritual power. The temple services were continued as in former years, and multitudes assembled to worship the living God. But pride and formality gradually took the place of humility and sincerity. Of Uzziah himself, it is written, when he was strong, his heart was lifted up to his destruction, for he transgressed against the Lord his God. Verse 16. The sin that resulted so disastrously to Uzziah was one of presumption, in violation of a plain command of Jehovah that none of but the descendants of Aaron should officiate as priests. The king entered the sanctuary to burn incense upon the altar. Azariah, the high priest and his associates remonstrated and pleaded with him to turn from his purpose. Thou hast trespassed, they urged, neither shall it be for thine honor. Verse 16 and 18. Uzziah was filled with wrath that he, the king, should thus be rebuked. But this was not, but he was not permitted to profane the sanctuary against the united protest of those in authority. While standing there in wrathful rebellion, as you said, sir, he was angry. He was suddenly smitten with a divine judgment. Leprosy appeared on his forehead. In dismay, he fled never again to enter the temple courts. Until the day of his death, some years later, Uzziah remained a leper, a living example of the folly of departing from a plain, thus saith the Lord. Neither his exalted position nor his long life of service could be pleaded as an excuse for presumptuous sin by which he marred the closing years of his reign and brought upon himself the judgment of heaven. God is, not a res is no respecter of persons. The soul that doeth ought presumptuously, whether he be born in the land or a stranger, or the same reproaches the Lord, and that soul shall be cut off from among his people. Numbers 15, 30. The judgment that befell Uzziah seemed to have a restraining influence on his son. Jotham bore heavy responsibilities during the years of his father's reign and succeeded to the throne after Uzziah's death. Of Jotham, it is written, He did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. He did according to all that his father Uzziah had done. Howbeit, the high places were not removed, and people sacrificed and burned incense still in high places. The reign of Uzziah was drawing to a close, and Jotham was already bearing many of the burdens of state. When Isaiah, the royal line of the royal line, was called, while yet a young man, to the prophetic mission. The times in which Isaiah was to labor were fraught with peculiar peril to the people of God. The prophet was to witness the invasion of Judah by the combined armies of the northern Israel and of Syria. He was to behold the Assyrian hosts in camp before the chief cities of the kingdom. During his lifetime, Samaria was to fall, and ten tribes of Israel was to be scattered among the nations. Judah was again and again to be invaded by the Assyrian armies, and Jerusalem was to suffer a siege that would have resulted in the, her downfall, had not God miraculously interposed. Although already grave perils were threatening the peace of the southern kingdom, the divine protection was being removed. And the Assyrian forces were about to overspread the land of Judah. But the dangers from without, overwhelmingly though they seemed, were not so serious as the dangers from within. It was the perversity of his people that brought to the Lord's servants the greatest perplexity and the deepest depression. By their apostasy and rebellion, those who should have stand, been standing as light bearers among the nations were inviting the judgment of God. Many of the evils which were hastening the swift destruction of the northern kingdom and which had recently been denounced in unmistakable terms by Hosea and Amos were fast corrupting the kingdom of Judah. The outlook was particularly discouraging as regards the social conditions of the people in their desire. Okay, let's listen to this one. In their desire for gain, men were adding house to house and field to field. See Isaiah 5, 8. Justice was perverted and no pity was shown to the poor. Of these evils, God declared, the spoil of the poor is in your houses. 
Ye beat my people to pieces and grind the faces of the poor. Isaiah 3, 14, 15. Even the magistrates whose duty was to protect the helpless turned a deaf ear to the sick cries of the poor and needy, the widows and the fatherless. Oh, Isaiah 10, 1 and 2. With oppression and wealth came pride and love of display. Gross drunkenness. Oh, it's very dangerous to drink. Diba, sir? And especially during party. And a spirit of revelry. And in Isaiah's day, idolatry itself no longer provoked surprise. Iniquitous practices had become so prevalent all among all classes that the few who remained true to God were often tempted to lose heart and to give way to discouragement and despair. It seemed as if God's purpose for Israel were about to fail and that the rebellious nation was to suffer a fate similar to that of Sodom and Gomorrah. In the face of such condition, it is not surprising that when, during the last year of Uzziah's reign, Isaiah was called to bear to Judah God's messages of warning and reproof, he shrank from the responsibility. He knew, he well knew that he would encounter obstinate resistance. He realized his own inability to meet the situation and thoughts of the stubbornness and unbelief of the people of whom he was to labor, his task seemed hopeless. Should he in despair relinquish his mission and leave Judah undisturbed to their idolatry? Were the gods of Nineveh to rule the earth in defiance of the God of heaven? Such thoughts as these were crowning, crowding through Isaiah's mind as he stood under the portico of the temple. Suddenly, the gate and the inner veil of the temple seemed to be uplifted or withdrawn. He was permitted to gaze within upon the holy of holies, where, where even the prophet's feet might not, might not enter. There rose up before him in a vision of Jehovah, sitting upon a throne high and lifted up, while the train of his glory filled the temple. On each side of the throne, Hovered the seraphim, their faces veiled in adoration, and they ministered before the Maker and united in the solemn invocation. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Until post and pillar and cedar gate seemed shaken with the sound, and the house was filled with the tribute of praise. As Isaiah beheld this revelation of the glory and majesty of his Lord, he was overwhelmed with a sense of the purity and holiness of God. How sharp the contrast between the much less perfection of his creator and the sinful course of those who he with himself had been long had long been numbered among the chosen people of Israel and Judah. So what did Isaiah say? Woe is me, he cried, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people with unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the king. And the Lord of hosts, standing as it were in the full sight of the divine presence within the inner sanctuary, he realized that if left to his own imperfection and inefficiency, he would be utterly unable to accomplish the mission to which he had been called. But a seraph was sent to relieve him of his distress and to fit him for his great mission. A living coal from the altar was laid upon his lips, and with the words, Lo, this has touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. And then the voice of God was heard saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And Isaiah, Isaiah responded, Here am I, send me. Verse 7 and 8. The heavenly visitor bade the awaiting messenger, Go and tell these people, Hear ye indeed, but understand not, and see ye indeed, but perceive not. Make the heart of the people fat, and make their ears heavy, and shut their eyes lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and convert and be healed. The prophet's duty was plain and he was to lift his voice in protest against the prevailing evils. But he dreaded to undertake the work without some assurance of hope. Lord, how long? He inquired. Are none of thy chosen people ever to understand and repent and be healed? His burden of soul in behalf of of erring Judah was not to be born in vain. His mission was not to be wholly 
fruitless. Yet the evils that had been multiplying for many generations could not be removed in his day. Throughout his lifetime, he must be patient, courageous teacher, a prophet of hope as well as of doom. The divine purpose finally accomplished the full fruitage of his efforts and the labors of all God's faithful messengers would appear. A remnant should be saved that this might be brought about the message, messages of warnings and entreaty were to be delivered to the rebellious nation. The Lord declared until the cities be wasted without inhabitant and the houses without men and the land be utterly desolate and the Lord have removed men far away and there be a great forsaking in the midst of the land. Wow. I think we finished the whole lesson. Okay, we read Ellen G. White's uh, story about Isaiah. And I was wondering, why did Isaiah say, woe is me? Sir Hill, what does Leviticus 16 to say? What will happen to people if they see God? According to Leviticus chapter 16, verse 2, And the Lord says to Moses, Tell Aaron, your brother, not to come at just any time into the holy place inside the veil before the mercy seat which is on the ark lest he die for I will appear in the cloud above the mercy seat so Isaiah knew that men who see God they will die because yeah because we have sin and sin is combustible and when we see God we are going to die Furthermore, it says in Exodus 33, 20, but he said, You cannot see my face, for no man shall see me and live. That's why uh, Isaiah was so afraid. Even Gideon in Judges 6, 22. Sir Hilde, right? Judges 6, 22 and 23. Now Gideon perceived that he was the angel of the Lord. So Gideon said, Alas, O Lord God. For I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. Then the Lord said to him, Peace be with you. Do not fear. You shall not die. So it's very scary really for us sinners to see God. Even Aaron in Leviticus 16.21, sir. Aaron shall put his hand on the head of the live goat, confess over it all the iniquities of the children of Israel, and all their transgressions concerning all their sins, putting them on the head of the goat, and shall send it away into the wilderness by the hand of, the suita of a suitable man. Uh, Sir Ian, can you explain that verse to us? I think if you will look at the uh, context of our Tuesday's lesson, this is about this is about becoming right with God. Uh, I think the, the title says, it says here, a new man. So it says here that um, Isaiah, he realized that he cannot do, because he was given a great task. Remember that when, when King Uzziah died and Jotham took over and then he was called by God. And then he realized that he cannot do anything. He did not have anything. He did not have the capability to do things within himself. So he realized that he really need the help of God. That's why he relied on God's power. And as you can see there in, in one of the texts says that the angel put, put a coal on, her, on his lips. And it says that the fire there signifies the cleansing of Isaiah, unlike Unlike Uzziah, who, who became proud, Isaiah really humbled himself before God because he realized that he cannot do the great task that was ahead of him when he was called by God. Yes, I think that is correct, sir, because it says in Numbers 31, 23, everything that can endure fire, you shall put through fire and it shall be clean. So fire has the cleansing. Uh, you know, sometimes in our lives, we have so many fires. But God is using that to cleanse our lives from sin. In fact, in Leviticus 6.12, it says, And the fire on the altar shall be kept burning on it. So fire is, has a holy purpose also. It shall not be put out, and the priest shall burn wood on it in every morning, the, and lay the burnt offering on it, and he shall 
burn on it the fat of the peace offering. So we go now to the Wednesday lesson. The title, the subtitle is Royal Commission, Isaiah 6, 8. Sir Hill, can you please uh, read for us this very nice commissioning verse? Oh, it's found in Isaiah 6, 8. It says, Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I, send me. Wow. You know what? Sometimes we pray that uh, we want to do something, but God has a, a plan for everything. I believe that Sir Hill and Sir Ian, everybody who is saved by God has a role in saving others. And this is our commission. We have to say, we have to be ready. When God needs a messenger, here am I, send me. An example is in Jeremiah 4. The prophet is called. When the word of the Lord came to me saying, Before I formed you in the womb, before I knew you, before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. Then said I, Ah, you know what? You, I read the Bible and the great controversy book. I want to be a prophet. I want to be a martyr. <laughs> But praise the Lord, in Joel 2 and in Acts 2, it says, In the last days, there will be prophets, men and daughters, your sons and daughters shall prophesy. In 1 Corinthians also, it says, Covet to prophesy. Okay, so let's study prophecy. Just let's not be false prophet. Let's only tell things that are in the Bible, according to the Bible, a clear, thus saith the Lord. Nothing more, nothing less. So in the call of uh, at Jeremiah, he said, I am, O Lord, God, behold, I cannot speak for I am a youth. But the Lord said, do not say I am a youth, for you shall go to all whom I send you. Young people, you read this verse. Do not say that you are a youth. I, uh, whatever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of their faces, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. This is in Jeremiah 1, 4 to 10. Very nice. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. See, have this day set to you over the nations and over the kingdoms, to root out and to pull down. Wow, very powerful. To destroy and throw down, to build and to plant. And that happened in Ezekiel, with Moses, with other prophets, Isaiah, and other people. Okay. In Psalm 73, 17, it says, Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I understood their end. So sometimes we don't understand. We go to church. The Holy Spirit will give us understanding. It has happened to me many times. So I really like to come to church. Okay, another encouragement to people who have heavy burden from the Lord to tell his people is in Hebrews 4.14. Sir Hill, you want to read that? Yes. Hebrews 4. Verses 14 to 16. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who have passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we yet without sin. As we are yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Wow, you know what? The word of the Lord is very scary because God is so holy, but salvation also comes with, that, uh, with the word of God. So if you, like in the last lesson, if you obey, there is blessing. If we don't obey, uh, we will be eaten by something else. Yeah, and uh, I like what was written in our lesson. If you will look, at our lesson it says here God's temple is filled with his power it is a place where people who are weak and make mistakes can come and find safety Amen. wow that includes us see Amen. <laughs> we can be sure that God works to save us because of Jesus Jesus is our high priest our chief holy leader in heaven yeah, it's very, it's very assuring, you know, Serene, <laughs> that really, we can really have hope and we have, we have this blessed hope in Jesus Christ. Yes, that is, everybody needs that because the older you are, the more sins you have and the more sins you have to repent and 
the more we need God. Okay, the last comforting verse in for the Wednesday lesson is in Revelation 5, 6. And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as though it, was, it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are of seven spirits, and God sent out to all the earth. So this is the lamb of God, yeah? It has capital L. So now let's go to our le uh, Thursday lesson, the appalling appeal, Isaiah 6. 9 to 3. Isaiah 6, 9 to 13. And he said, Go and tell these people, Keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of these people dull, and their ears heavy, and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and return and be healed. Then I said, Lord, how long? And he answered, Until the cities are laid waste and without inhabitant. The houses are without a man. The land is utterly desolate. The Lord has removed men far away, and the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land. But yet a tent will be in it, and will return and be for consuming, as a terebinth. Three, as an oak whose stamp remains when it is cut down, so the holy seed shall be its stamp. So this is a little bit perplexing, but we go, the Bible explains itself. In Matthew 13, 13 to 15, it says, Therefore I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. And in them the prophecy of Isaiah, oh, this is very, refers to Isaiah, is fulfilled, which says, hearing you will not hear, and so on and so forth. Their ears are hard in hearing, and their eyes they were, have been closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with ears. So, uh, does God want to us to repent? How come it's like that, sir? God doesn't want any one of us to die. Okay. He wants us to be saved. Every one of us. That's why God has given us a warning. But sometimes, we, as people, we tend to ignore these warnings and we are not uh, very particular with those things, even the little ones, you know, as, as Christians. That's why God is instructing us and giving us this, His holy words, the lessons that we are studying every day in our homes so that our minds will, will be inculcated with, with God's teaching, with His words, so that we can stand and we will be able to discern what God wants us to understand every day. Yes, sir. Sir, he has a verse for that. Yes. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 9, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but, all, but that all should come to repentance. I just want to emphasize long-suffering. God is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. Praise the Lord. Ezekiel 2.5 further emphasizes, As for them, whether they hear or whether they refuse, for they are a rebellious house, yet they will know that a prophet has been among them. So the job of the prophet is to tell. Whether they listen or not, blessing or curse will come. Now, this is one of my favorite uh, passages in the Bible. Ezekiel uh, 3 16 now it came to pass in the end of seven days that the word of the Lord came to me son of man I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel therefore hear a word from my mouth and give them warning from me when I say to the wicked you shall surely die and you give no warning nor speak to warn the wicked or from his way wicked way to save his life that same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at your hand. 19. Yet, if you warn the wicked, and he does not turn from his wickedness, nor from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity, but you have delivered your soul. Verse 20. Again, when a righteous man turns from his righteousness, and commits iniquity, and lay a stumbling block before him, he shall die, because you did not give him warning. But he shall die in his sin, and his righteousness, which he has done, shall not be remembered. 
but his blood I will require at your hand. Nevertheless, if you warn the righteous man that the righteous should not sin, and he does not sin, he shall surely live, because he took warning, and you will have delivered your soul also. Wow. So, uh, it's very scary. When the Lord sends messages to us, we have to tell. Yes, we have really the responsibility because as you can see here, Ezekiel was commissioned as watchman, you know. If you are a watch watchman, you really have to watch out, look out for anything suspicious or anything that will cause harm to, to the people, to your property or to the uh, uh, responsibility that was given to you. So it really pays. <laughs> It really pays to perform your job as a watchman. And I think as a Christian, as Christians, we have this responsibility because God has given us the message. And this message should be our message to other people so that, so that they too will learn and they will know the message that God wants them to know. I have a question. Does God harden our hearts or the hearts of other people? Like how the verses said that they might not they see but they don't understand and so on. And let's look into the Bible. There is another example. It says, when you go back to Egypt in Exodus 4, see that you all this, do all these wonders before Pharaoh. And I will, but I will harden his heart. Oh, this is a very common question. So he will not let the people go. And then Exodus 15 explains, uh, 8.15 says, but when Pharaoh saw that there was relief, he hardened his heart. Oh, so he hardened his heart and did not hear them as the Lord has said. I think there is, God has uh, foresight, but he still gives freedom of choice. Yes. God just knows. Like in the classroom, some people say, you study. If you don't, you will fail. But they don't study. But so they fail, right? God knows if you don't study, you fail if you study you succeed but he you have a choice whether you study or not exodus 8 32 says but pharaoh hardened his heart at this time also neither would he let the people go so pharaoh uh, actually hardened it's there are more verses that says that he hardened his heart so th that's the nice thing about the bible you just read the whole thing and uh, somewhere else the lord will explain it to you using the bible the one very comforting thing is in 1 Corinthians 10, 13. It says, no temptation has overtaken you. Oh, this is like temptation or trials, diba, sir? Has overtaken you except what is common to man. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. Will the teacher give you a quiz that you cannot answer? God is a perfect teacher. Whatever he gives you a test or a quiz or an examination, the answer is there is an answer. That is what the Bible says. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation, we will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. So in closing, uh, Sir Ian, you want to say additional things that we might have forgotten? I think our lesson this week is really interesting because it talks about crisis in responsibility. So meaning, as I look at it, God has really given us a great responsibility that we have to perform. But sometimes, because of our, you know, we want to follow our own will, we divert to that responsibility that God has given us. And we try to do the things that are, you know, for ourselves only. That's why what happened in this lesson was, yeah, King Uzziah, we remembered what happened to him. And then there goes, uh, God called Isaiah. And then the burden was given to him. And he realized that he cannot really do it within himself. That's why he confessed everything about himself. He confessed that he is a sinner and he do not have the power to do these things. And God cleansed him and enabled him to do the things. That's why it says here that uh, there is a verse that says, who, who, um, shall I send? Whom shall I send? But Isaiah willingly said, Lord, here am I. Send me. And that is accepting 
the responsibility that God has given to us. Okay, we want to close with this verse in Isaiah 1, verse 19 and 20. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured by the sword. For the mouth of the Lord hath spoken. Okay, let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the warnings and the stories in the Bible. We ask, Lord, that you please cleanse our lips, Lord. We are like Isaiah. We have uh, impure lips when we are around people who are impure lips. And when we see your glory, Lord, all our sins become so, we, we have nothing to say, Lord. We are fearful, but we have your, you, are, you are our only hope, Lord. We have nothing else to hope in this life. We ask you, Lord, to give us wisdom and understanding to do your work. Boldness, Lord, as you have given the people before, to save more people from their sins, Lord, to help you to be instrumental, your instruments in spreading your word, in warning, in uh, giving rebuke and hope to the world. We totally depend on you, Lord. Lead us and guide us, also the listeners and the viewers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.